So friction is a force that resists the movement of an object when it's trying to move across a surface. So, you know, a ball rolling across the ground. Friction, you know, is the reason that the ball doesn't keep rolling on forever and ever. When an object is in contact with a surface, you know, it's sliding across the surface, then the surface is exerting a contact force on the object. We break that contact force into its vertical and horizontal components. So the vertical component, the part that's perpendicular to the surface, that's what the normal force is. You know, remember, the normal force is also just the surface exerting some force on the object. And so then the horizontal part, you know, the part that's parallel to the surface, that's called friction. So you can think of friction and the normal force as really two parts of the same force, the contact force that the surface exerts on the object when it is sliding across it. Really, what this contact force is, you know, the normal force and the friction force, they are results of you know, inter intermolecular attractions and you know, electrostatic repulsions on a microscopic level. You know, so the reason you know, you know, say a book on a table doesn't fall through the table is because all the electrons in the atoms of the book and the table are repelling each other. And so, you know, as you'd expect, friction is always opposite of the direction of the motion. So, you know, if an object is moving to the right across a surface, then friction is going to be to going to the left. Also, if an object is at rest and you're trying to push it to the right, then friction is still going to be acting to the left. So it's always trying to resist the motion of the whatever object it is. And also, friction is directly proportional to the normal force. You know, this kind of makes sense if you think of the, the normal force and friction as two parts of the same contact force. You know, if one component's larger, then the other component should be larger as well. The constant of proportionality in this relationship between the friction force and the normal force, we call that the coefficient of friction, which is denoted by this letter mu. It's kind of like a, a u with a long side on the left. And so this coefficient of friction is a dimensionless number. Dimensionless means it doesn't have any units. That's because on the left you have friction, which is a force. So the, the units of friction are newtons, and the units of the normal force are newtons. So both sides already have the same units, so that means the mu doesn't have any units of its own. Because if you solved for mu, you would have friction divided by the normal force. Newtons divided by newtons is nothing, no units. Okay, so this mu is usually between 0 and 1. And so for the larger it is, you know, that means the more friction there is between these two surfaces. You know, the, the value of mu depends on the two surfaces that are in contact. So for any two surfaces, it's going to be different. So the only way to, note the, to figure out the mu is to do experiments. So we're going to see there's two main types of friction. And so the first one is called static friction. Static friction is when an object is at rest, and you say you, tried, you, put, you put a force on it, you're trying to make the object move. And so static friction is what resists the object starting to move. So static friction is trying to keep the object at rest. So let's say you, you have this box, you know, and you're exerting the force, the capital F force, to the right. And so static friction is going to pull to the left in order to counteract your force. So static friction can actually change its value depending on the situation. So you can see that, you know, in this equation, it's not an equal sign, but you have the force of friction, static friction is less than or equal to, you know, the coefficient of static friction times the normal force. So it, the friction, the static friction can range from zero all the way up to the maximum of this number, mu times the normal force. All right, so let's say the object is at rest and th there's no one trying to push it. Then there's, there's no friction either. But then you exert a 5 newton force to the right. 
So the static friction is going to exit a 5 Newton force to the left. And then you increase your force to 15 Newtons. Well, then the static friction is going to increase to 15 Newtons as well in order to counteract your force. But let's say this here, mu times normal force is 25 Newtons. So the maximum value of the static friction is 25 Newtons. So when you exert a 25 Newton force to the right, static friction is going to be 25 Newtons to the left. The object is still isn't moving. But when you increase your force to 30 Newtons, then static friction still is only 25 Newtons because that's its maximum value. So that now the object's going to start moving because there's a net external force to the right. So static friction can change its value in order to fight any movement. Now, the other type of friction occurs when the object is already moving. And so if an object is already in mo if an object is already moving across the surface, then the friction is going to be called the kinetic friction. So here we have a block that's moving already at 5 meters per second to the right. So now the friction is, is still going to be pointing to the left. You know, friction is always resisting the movement. So here you can see that the, the force of kinetic friction is equal to, you know, it's an equality this time, the, the, f the coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal force. So notice how the coefficient of friction is different for static friction and kinetic friction, even for the same two types of surfaces. And so in general, the coefficient of kinetic friction is going to be less than the coefficient of static friction. So what that means is, it's easier to keep an object moving. The hard part is to get it moving in the first place. Because the friction that resists that initial movement, the static friction, is usually stronger than the kinetic friction. We're going to look at one example. So we have two blocks, M1 and M2. One of them is on, M2 is on a table with some friction. And M1 is suspended above the air. We're going to look at this situation right when the blocks start moving. So we can just worry about the, we can say the friction on the table is going to be the kinetic friction. We don't have to worry about the static friction. So we can draw all the forces on the blocks. On M1, no, there's just going to be gravity, which is M1 times G, and then there's going to be that, that tension in the string. But we don't have to worry about that, and you'll see why. And then on block 2, there's the gravity force, and then there's the normal force, which is counteracting gravity. And then there's the friction force, which is pointing to the left, because the block is going to be moving to the right. And so we want to find the acceleration of the system. And remember, the two blocks are going to have the same acceleration, because they're connected by this rope. So in order to do that, we're going to pretend the two blocks are part of the same system. So we're going to pretend that there's just one giant block with a mass of m1 plus m2. And we're also going to pretend that this giant block is only moving to the right and the left, not down or up. And so w when we take this big block, then the tension in the rope is going to become an internal force because it's you know, inside a two-block system. So now we just have one giant block with a mass of m1 plus m2, and then there's a force of gravity to the right, that's this m1 times g, and then to the left, the only force is the force of friction, you know, because the normal force and the gravity on m2 are going to be canceling out. So now we just have to use Newton's second law on this giant block. So the next external force is going to be m1 times g minus the force of friction, which, remember, is the coefficient of friction times the normal force. So in other words, mu times m2g, because we know what the normal force is. So that's going to be equal to the combined mass times the acceleration. And so from there, all we have to do is solve for the acceleration of the system. 